real quick. Wow, I just have to say this place is this place is really special. Um, man, Pastor Danny, Emily, all the leaders here. Shout out to our first Wednesday night Pulse group, our leaders Pulse group, and just all the leaders and all of you guys. Thank you so much for um, just embracing my wife and myself as who we are, and uh, you guys mean a lot to us. Um, my parents are here, by the way, my family and friends, my sister. Uh, I also just wanted to say, uh, you know, in the conversation of ordination, uh, my wife has sacrificed a lot for this calling. Um, she actually left her previous church, and she also stepped away from a career uh, to support me in this calling. So I just want to say, I love you. I'm not usually this emotional. I'm just kidding. I cry all the time. I saw Moana, and I cried in the theater. It was so bad. I know, right? It's an emotional movie, man. It's my, my people. Uh, <laughs> all right, just to begin, um, a little crazy story. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had this dream. And in this dream, it was one of those dreams where you wake up, and you're like, did this really happen? It felt like so surreal. And in the dream, I'm backstage at this event, and there's somebody on stage, and they're speaking, and they're teaching. And uh, you could see in the crowd that people are, you know, they're anxious, they're impatient, they're like tapping on their, their fingers, looking at their watches, and they're waiting for something. And then uh, somebody from the, the audience gets up and they come backstage and they tap me on the shoulder. And they're like, hey, um, we just wanted to know, when do you go on? Now at the time, I was just a DJ and a dancer. So I'm like, go on, like I didn't bring my equipment, I don't know what you're talking about, right? And like, no, no, no. like, you know, a couple of us came to listen to you, like when do you go on? And I'm like, Dude, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. And then all of a sudden, in the background, you hear people clapping and they're applauding. So the speaker that was on stage, they ended and they, they got off stage. And then the, the stage manager backstage, she has her headphones on. She takes them off. She looks at me. She's like, you're on. And I'm like, I'm on. What are you talking about? Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. She kind of nudges me onto the stage. And she's like, yeah, it's, you're on. Go, go. And I'm like, what am I going to talk about? I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm walking on stage. What am I supposed to do? I've never done this before. Because public speaking was just not on my radar. And then she points to my stomach. And she's like, don't worry, everything you need to know is right there. And then I get on stage, and then I wake up. And it was bothering me for a long time. And I couldn't, like, fall back asleep. So I called Borchin. We were just dating at the time. So I call her, and I'm like, babe, like, I had this dream. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it means. And Borchin has, like, this weird, like, attraction to, like, pastoral ministry and leadership and stuff like that. She's like, are you going to be, like, a pastor and stuff? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know what that means. <laughs> so then, <laughs> So then... I just felt like maybe there was a calling on my life. So uh, the next day, which was a Sunday, because the dream happened Saturday night, I go to a local church. Uh, this church I've gone to before. I'm friends with the pastor. Uh, so I show up at the church, and they're giving their you know, normal inspirational, motivational speech to get your money. And they're talking. <laughs> and uh, in his sermon, he's like, we're going on a journey. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what we're doing, but we're going to be okay. Somebody say we're going to be okay. And I'm like, I hope we're going to be okay. And then he points to me, and he's like, Brendan, come on stage. I'm like, here we go. And I go on stage. And I had friends with me because I had, like, an emotional night. So, like, we're, we're there. And uh, he's looking at me, and he's like, Brendan, you're going on a journey. And you don't know where you're going or what you're doing, but you're going to be okay. And then he points to my stomach, and he says, everything you need to know is right there. And he says, because from your belly will flow rivers of living water. And in that moment, rivers of water came flowing from my eyes, and I'm in front of friends and a community that I barely know, and I'm just crying because that just happened. The dream and then, like, the spiritual confirmation, and it kind of leads us to where we are today. And just to add a little bit more magic to the mystery, my wife and I, we have uh, these memory jars and in the memory jars, we write down memories and we put the date down. Uh, and what we do is at, at, in the, at the end of the year, we look back at all the great memories that we had. It's really nice to do with your friends and family, right? So we write down the memories, put them in the jar. If you were to go to 2014 memory jar and you pull out that card that talks about the dream, the dream happened on February 2nd, 2014. And the spiritual confirmation happened on February 3rd, 2014. And 2019, February 3rd, I can stand before you guys as an ordained pastor of Harway Church. (laughs) 
Whew. All right. So as I was preparing this morning, I really wanted to bring my best. I wanted to bring some sort of inspirational, motivational message, not to get your money, but just to, you know, uh, to kind of uh, bring things forward on the first day on the job, right? Uh, and as I was writing, I was like, I want to write the greatest sermon ever. And as I was writing, I just couldn't figure out the words to put. So I thought, you know, let me take this opportunity to share a little bit of my story of how I got here and what I've been through. Now, it's been a lot of left turns and ups and downs and a lot of heartbreaks, a lot of letdowns, but I've gained some insights along the way, so I wanted to share those insights with you. But also, on the first day in the job, I wanted to share my intentions as a pastor as well. Now, usually when people have this type of experience, it deeply changes their life, and they want to dedicate the rest of their life to spreading the message of the gospel, and bringing people to Christ. And I just want to be very honest and upfront to begin. For myself, that is not my intention. Hear me out. Because I think that our role, not just my role, but as a community, is not so much to bring people to Christ. I think that our role is to bring the love of Christ to people. Those are very different approaches. What often happens is that a lot of church communities, they get overly focused and obsessed with raising our hands and confessing the name of Jesus and how many numbers that is, rather than just caring about people in the name of Jesus and the way that Jesus would have loved people in the first place. I believe that our role and our mission is not necessarily to spread the gospel. It is to be the gospel. That is a different approach when it comes to our faith. So in my experience, what often happens is that when you present the gospel, it is just words. And oftentimes those words are just empty words. And I've always had an issue with that when it comes to my own spiritual journey. Back in the day, any period of time, by the way, that I, can, that I am considered before my wife Borchin, I call it the dark ages. Uh, and in the dark ages, I was dating this one girl. And, you know, I don't want to mention any names, but her name sounds like Catherine. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, her and I, we would always have, like, these deep conversations. And we would talk about love and relationships and life. Um, and the conversation was always intellectually stimulating. But as far as our relationship would go, it was just words. That's as far as it would go. Because she would talk about how much she cared about me, but th I never felt like she cared about me. She would paint a beautiful picture about like what relationships could be or should be, but never once did I feel secure in that relationship. And to be honest, a lot of times in my spiritual journey, that's how I felt. I felt like I was in an insecure relationship that I didn't know if I was safe in. And it just felt like words, and it felt like empty words. One of my problems, and I have this issue and I'm working on it, is that for a lot of people that are spiritual, they are so in love with the concept of love, but they're not loving. They're so in love with the idea, the romanticism of love, but they themselves do not know how to love. There's this quote that, about a salad that really helps. Check this out. I think it's up here. Like a salad with lots of colors, but no greens. It has everything else except what you need. Okay, think of a salad. It needs the greens, but without it, it's just dressing. It's just colors, which means it's just decor and dressing to make it tasteful, but there's no nutrition. It's not what you need. It has everything else except for what you need. Because there's a big difference between saying that you love and then being love. And for a couple of years, before I even came to Heartway Church, I actually, a lot of people don't know this. So I'm a little nervous about sharing these stories with you guys, but I've actually been kicked out of churches. I've been, uh, yeah, amen. All right. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> Uh, I, I actually was pushed out and I was asked to, or nicely asked to leave. Um, and I just had issues in the sense of like, I just had a lot of questions. But you know how it is in faith communities, you don't ask questions, you just believe, right? You don't doubt, you just believe and that that's what the pastor says, that's what it is, right? And I just had issues with that. Like my dad always said, like, believe nothing of what you hear and only half of what you see. One time um, I was at this youth event. I was involved in this youth ministry. And uh, the youth uh, pastor, he calls all the kids and he's like, everybody come. Who wants to see a miracle? And I'm like, oh, here we go. And he makes a circle and uh, all the kids come and he does his little performance thing. And I'm just standing there and, you know, he does his thing. And all the kids, they walk away. They're in awe. They're in shock. You know, they, they, they want to dedicate their lives to Jesus in this moment. Uh, you know, and I, I don't want to say that the miracles did or didn't happen. That wasn't my issue. My issue was the presentation of it. So I was respectful, and I waited till the end of the event, and I pulled him to the side, and I'm like, hey, uh, I just want to know, like, you know, like, when Jesus would perform healings, and he would do these miracles, it's almost as if, like, he would tell people not to tell anybody, right? 
Like he would, he didn't want to make a big show of these miracles. Where do you stand on that? And he held my shoulder. He looked at me and he said, oh, disciple, (laughs) you have so much to learn. (laughs) And I said, you didn't answer my question. (laughs) And he didn't answer my question. He walked away. And previous to this event, he would call or text and just contact me because I'm, I'm very involved in the youth. I have a passion for the youth. I'm a little kid, like literally. I'm a little kid, so like, I, I'm just involved. And uh, after this event, no call, no text. I even tried to reach out to him and nothing. I was ignored. And I learned through this experience that sometimes no answer is the answer. So I moved on. I went to another youth ministry. And this one was a little bit like a tighter circle. They were more involved in schools, uh, involved with kids that have problems at home. And uh, there was this one kid that really messed up. He got suspended from school. And in the group, he always would show up late. So we had the group. Pastor started talking. And then in comes this kid. And this kid... He sits down, and you could tell he's angry. But the thing is, it's like youth groups, it's like, it's like the best thing that they have in their life right now, right? So no matter what happens, I feel like we still need to treat it in a sensitive manner. Sits down, the youth pastor looks at him and says, are you stupid? And I had this moment, exactly, I had this moment where I was like, you know those moments like you just react, you don't think about it? I was like, what kind of crap is that? Underneath my breath, and he heard me, and he didn't like that. So then after, you know, the study... I go up to him, and I'm like, hey, look, man, I'm sorry. I probably shouldn't have reacted that way. I was just a little taken back by how what happened, but I just want to say that I was sorry. And he cuts me off, and he says, don't you ever curse in front of my kids. And I was like, curse? Like, I said, crap. Like, I'm pretty sure ass is in the Bible. Like, crap isn't that bad, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and he said, don't you ever bring profanity in this youth group. And, I'm, and I was very confused in this moment. And he started bringing up, like, different scriptures. And he was like, you know, uh, life and death is at the power of the tongue. I'm like, hey, look, if we're going to talk about that, right? I don't know which is And I'll be honest, I was immature. And I just kind of was, like, getting angry. And I told him, I was like, which is worse? If I say that you're effing amazing or if you are stupid, which is, which is speaking death? And he got so angry. And for me, this was my problem. My problem is that, like, I understand that there's words that socially we understand as curse words. But when it comes to like how we talk to the youth especially, like this is the best thing that they have going on in their lives. And everybody's telling them that they're not good enough and that they're not smart enough. So the last thing that they need is a youth ministry that is telling them that they're not good enough, that they're not smart enough, that they're stupid. Yeah, he didn't like that. So uh, I moved on and I found myself at a more mature group, a men's group. I was like, you know I need to be around more mature people. That's what I was I was in this men's group. And I was like, friendly to shut up. Don't say a thing. Just sit there and be there. Nothing, okay? <laughs> and I swear to you, I sit down, and the topic is heaven and hell. And I'm like, this cannot be happening. <laughs> and in the conversation of, of it, uh, one of the gentlemen says that he's afraid for his mom because his mom is sick. And she's, you know, older, and he's not sure where she's going to go when she dies. And they decide that it's a good idea to go around the circle and ask everybody their opinion on how they can evangelize mom. And I I didn't say a thing. I was like, don't say nothing. (laughs) And they got to me and they're like, Brendan, what's what's your thoughts? What do you think? And I chose my words very carefully. And I said, look, I think regardless of what she believes, I think that this is a great opportunity to still love her. Because as a parent, I feel that they love their children. And the last thing that they definitely want to experience is that their children love them even up until their last breath. So regardless of what she believes, I think it's a great time to still love her. It was awkwardly silent in the room. And then we prayed. And then we left. And then uh, the next day, I get a phone call. Hey, uh, Brendan, um, look, we really liked your contribution to the conversation. We just don't think you're a good fit for this group. You see things a little bit more differently than we do, and maybe you're better off finding something or somewhere else. At this point in my journey, I'm a little bit used to it now. So I said, okay, I moved on. And it's experiences like this and many more that I went through. And just to add a a little bit more sprinkles to the show. 2012, my friends and I, we started this event called House of Drums. And it was our, I guess you could say, interpretation of reaching out to the youth and uh, uh, giving them a positive place so that they can get off the streets and stay out of trouble and just to do something good with their creative energies. 
and it was a really great event. And you know, and actually next month they're celebrating their seventh year anniversary. It's still going on. It's awesome. And uh, in around 2013, 2014, we found ourselves in the New Times, like in art, in an article a couple of times, and it went online, and I shared it, and then I see somebody reposted it. And they reposted it, and the guy that reposted it is the guy that kicked me out of his study <laughs> for cursing. And he claimed to be my mentor in youth ministry. Oh. <laughs> it's moments like this that really tainted me. It tainted my faith. It challenged me in a lot of ways. And I learned that people, they hold on to their beliefs tighter than they will ever hold on to your hand in life. And I started to think that those old sayings were true, that in the pulpits, they preach love, but their lives promote war and violence and hate. And I know that sounds extreme, but my problem with this whole thing was that people's beliefs, they didn't line up with their behavior. And it made me angry, and I got, I got bitter, and I thought, what was the point in all this? Like, why does all this really matter? So I started to live that way. I started to live as if nothing really mattered. But the problem with that is, like, waking up every day without meaning, without purpose, it not only affects you, it affects the people around you. And I got really lonely. And then after that, life started to get really tough. But man, I'm stubborn, and my life had to, get, had to be tougher. My faith had to be tougher. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to give this one last shot. One last shot. And if it doesn't work out, then I can walk away, but I got to keep going. So I decided that I was going to do something that I've never done before. I bought tickets to a worship concert. Okay, hear me out. A lot of you guys don't know. I'm slightly agoraphobic, like I'm kind of afraid of crowds. That's why I'm either at the front or the back. And here's my fear. If something happens and I'm in the middle of that crowd, I'm a little guy. And it only takes a couple steps for people to. And that's a real fear of mine. Ask my wife. Whenever we're in crowds, I hold her hand like a little kid. I'm like, take me out of here. Take me out of here. It's the weirdest thing. I'm just afraid I'm going to die in a crowd. So I go to this worship concert. Uh, a couple of my friends and I, we bought these tickets. It uh, wasn't like big names. It was local artists. Uh, but it was well promoted, and I'm a sucker for, you know, good marketing. So we go to this event. We put in their GPS. We show up to the venue. And I'm thinking it's going to be like a concert hall. And it wasn't a concert hall. It was like a smaller venue. I'm like, whatever, you know, we're here for Jesus, right? So we go. And I start, I put my head down. I like just, just, just focus on God. Focus on God. I get up to the venue, and I, I, I look, and I'm like, it's not a concert hall. It's a straight-up church. I'm like, oh, we're going into a church. We're going into church. We're okay. We go to the church. I bump into some people. I say, hey, my name is Brendan. Uh, so glad to be here. Really looking forward to this evening. And they look at me really weird. And then they walk away. And I'm like, okay, church people, whatever. I go into the venue, and it's a very traditional setting. It's not like, you know, chairs or rows. It's like straight-up wooden pews on the side. And I don't want to go to the front. I told you about my crowd thing. You know, I'm in the middle. I don't want to go to the front because I know all these people, and I, I'll just stay in the back. So I stay in the back. I sit down in the pews, and my friends are with me. And I'm looking around for, like, a sound system. I don't see a sound system. I'm like, what is going on? Something's happening. So let me go talk to somebody. So I stand up. I fix myself up so I'm presentable. I have, like, a nice white shirt. I got, like, a tie on, like, a nice colorful tie because that was my thing back in the day. And I get up, and I go to talk to somebody and I look at the pews next to me and a bunch of people are filling up those seatings and I look and they're wearing all black and I said oh crap excuse my language <laughs> and I look at the front and there's no stage no sound system just an open casket we showed up at a funeral and I never walk so fast out the exit. I get into the car. My friends are laughing, and I'm laughing but partially crying because I'm an emotional person. And I'm crying, and I'm like, what is going on? And we just disrespected a family and crashed a funeral. I saw a dead body. I experienced death. And I said, I'm looking forward to this evening to the family. I pulled a Pastor Danny without ever knowing Pastor Danny. <laughs> Oh, my God. But this event, it made sense to me because I had gone to salvage my faith, and I ended up at a funeral. And I felt like the faith or the idea of God that I was chasing, it died. And the life and the lifestyle that I was living as well wasn't working, and that needed to go too because being bitter and being angry and mad at the world – it started to change me and turn me into the very thing that I was against, which is being a person that believes in something, but your behavior doesn't match up. 
Because if you're a f- person of faith, it's not about fighting against what you hate. It's about standing up for what you believe in. And I feel that so much of not only my journey, but the church's journey is like that. It's overly focused on what we don't believe rather than what we do believe. We should be the most loving person in the room. That's how I believe faith should be. And for myself, I found that not being that way started taking me to a direction that I didn't want to be. And I looked in the mirror and I didn't like that person. You can't live your life centered from who you're not because that's not even like half empty or half full. That's just an empty glass. And if you wake up every single day that way, you can become a very lonely person. I mean, can you imagine waking up every day and not caring? Can you imagine waking up every day as if nothing mattered? Like, what if we lived in a world where nobody cared? What if we lived in a world where everyone woke up and they lived as if nothing mattered? Do you know what that would look like? It's called hell. That's what it is. It's a living hell. And in my own misery and pain, in my own hell, is where I feel I ended up at a funeral and I bumped into Jesus. So I told myself that I was going to keep going, but I was going to try to go a different route. And I set on a New Jersey journey, and, I, and I, I, I cut my ties with any spiritual baggage that I had so that I can heal. And I was still church hurt. I was still burnt. But I, I, I said to myself, I have hope, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on that, if anything. Um, so I go on on a whole wandering spiritual journey. I reconnect with Borchin. Uh, I have that dream, and a whole bunch of things happen. Uh, I end up at a Rob Bell event. Um, and... Um, Rob Bell, for me, you know, he is a controversial speaker and teacher, but I found a lot of refuge and and safety in his teachings. So I went to the event, and I look up to him as a public speaker as well. The event ends. It was a really nice event. And then up comes this bodybuilder dude, (laughs) and he introduces himself with his bodybuilder wife. (laughs) And he's like, hey, I'm Pastor Danny, Danny Prada. This is my wife, Emily. And, uh, you know, I heard that you live in the Davie Fort Lauderdale area. And if you like what this guy's saying, maybe you'll like what I have to say. You should check us out, Heartway Church. So I was very reluctant, but I was also very curious. So I started going. I started attending. My wife and I, we started serving just to, you know, kind of figure things out and heal through our own process. And when I first came to Heartway Church, Pastor Danny, he sat me down, and we had a conversation um, for some coffee. And... uh, He asked me, you know, with everything that I've been through, because I told him my doubts, my fears, my problems, all my hurts, my pains when it comes to the Christianity uh, tradition. And he's like, you know, with everything that you've been through, like, why are you still here? Like, what you've experienced, why do you still believe? And I thought about it, and I was like, to be honest, no matter how far I run, the story of Jesus is the most beautiful love story you'll ever hear. And a part of me wants to always believe that that is true, that that is real. I mean, I'm not talking about just like the miraculous birth and the death and the resurrection. I'm talking about the actual life that Jesus lived. His life was captivating, like compelling. And those, those are things that I just can't get over. And, and one, of my, one of my struggles is, is Christianity dismissing the life of Jesus. It's so focused on the birth, the death, and the resurrection. But if you only focus on that, like that's good stuff, but if you only focus on that, you miss a lot of stuff. Some very, very important things like the life of Jesus because Jesus wasn't just like a baby and then a man on a cross. He was a human being that had a family. He was a child that had parents. He was a brother. He was a cousin. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher. He was a political figure. He was a historical figure, a spiritual figure, a religious figure. I mean, to me, Jesus was a capital G. (laughs) And it's the way that he lived, the way that he lived. And still to this day, his life has kept me grounded in my faith aside everything else. I mean, when you think about the birth, what what the birth is so significant is that it was this new way of being, this new way of life that was bursting forward into humanity. And his, and his death was a direct response to the very life that he lived because he defied a global superpower and he challenged the religious establishment of his day and so much that he was murdered. And for me, those are the facts that mean a lot to me. 
and what keeps me grounded to my faith. I mean, think about how we treated people. You think about doubting Thomas. For me, doubting Thomas is someone that I really resonate with. Because when Jesus dies and he resurrects and he comes back, he reveals himself to his disciples, and Thomas doesn't believe it's him. He, he doubts. That's why they call him Doubting Thomas. And Jesus doesn't judge him. He doesn't reprimand him. He doesn't punish him. He says, here, touch my scars and see that they're real. Jesus invites Thomas into his doubt. And through his doubt is where he finds his faith. And a lot of times when we meet people and we counter them, when they doubt or they question, we shun them, we kick them out, we, we dismiss them. But no, we need to invite people into their doubt. That's how Jesus treated people. Think about Mary Magdalene. Not just the fact that Jesus basically saved her life in so many ways, and, but the fact that he was her mentor. Like we forget that during those times, women were not allowed in educational circles. So even Jesus, his take on equality was very different in the times that he was and also in a lot of ways in the times that we are in now. And then you think about Matthew, the tax collector. I mean, still to this day, nobody likes tax collectors. But Matthew, the tax collector, wh what is so significant about that? Like Jesus would sit down with a tax collector. Have you ever wondered why Mary and Joseph, why they would always have to come back to the city, the temple? They always had to travel there. They didn't live there. But Joseph was in the line of priests. Right? He was from the line of King David. So he was part of that family, that lineage, but he didn't live in the city. He didn't live by the temple, but he was a, a big part of the temple. Why? Why do they always have to commute there? Because they couldn't afford to live there. Because the tax situation was horrendous. You had to pay city tax. You had to pay temple tax. You had to pay military tax. And much of the military tax was so that Rome, the Roman Empire, can spread the good news of Caesar. So that the Roman Empire can spread. And if you defied them, then you were crucified. That's where a lot of the the military tax went to. So people just literally couldn't afford to live in the city. They had to live somewhere else, even if you were part of that family. So when Jesus sits down with a tax collector, it's a sensitive topic for a lot of people because everybody is affected by the tax collector. But Jesus sits down and he humanizes somebody that we demonize. And I think that's really important to see how countercultural that is. I mean, and then we talk about the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, he talks about the Good Samaritan when he, gives, when he gives the greatest commandment, which is to love your neighbor as yourself, not realizing that the neighbor is the Samaritan. Jesus is talking about the Samaritan because the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along. So when he says, love your neighbor as yourself, he's saying, love the person that you don't like. Love the neighbor that you got issues with. Love that person that's difficult to love. You want to receive the kingdom of God? That's, that's it right there. Learn to love those people that you don't see eye to eye with. I mean, every time he would do something so countercultural, and you think you have him figured out, and then he would just flip your world upside down. I mean, Jesus was controversial, but he was also, people were drawn to him because he was more than just words. He was a person of action. He was the word that became flesh. He was love incarnate. If you want to know what unconditional love looks like, you look at Jesus, but not just the person of Jesus, you look at the very life that Jesus lived. Last year, when our son Bodhi was born, we had friends and family come visit. It was a really special week. Um, some friends were hanging out in the hospital room, and Pastor Danny came by. Um, and Pastor Danny asked me a question. He said, you know, how do you plan to raise Bodhi, like traditional, non-traditional, biblically? Um, and I said, you know, to be honest, I don't think that I can really say anything or any words can really, um, I don't think that the greatest thing that I can teach my son is with words. I think that the greatest thing that I can teach my son is with the very life that I live. And when I think about even how I was raised, I don't remember what my parents said word for word. One, because I have ADD, but two, I just don't listen. <laughs> but my mom, mom's the type of person that when everything is going wrong, she always does what she feels is right. And my dad, even when things get difficult, he never strays from the truth. And he'll be honest with you, even if the truth hurts, because he believes in the truth. And they set an example for me that that's the type of life that I wanted to live too. And I, tr and I still try to this day to live that life. And I don't necessarily remember what they said, but I do remember how they lived. Because the truth is people don't remember the words you say. They remember the life that you live. 
as Jesus would say, by their fruit, you will know them. Meaning if you want to know somebody's true character, don't listen to what they say. Look at the life that they live. Because it's possible to be really smart, to be knowledgeable, to be very theologically sound and still be a jerk. And you'll find out that there's people that are full of life and love, and then there's people that are just full of themselves. And then there's people that are full of the spirit, and then there's others that are just full of stuff. (laughs) By their fruit, you will know them. Uh, A couple weeks ago, I put up a Facebook rant. And I don't rant on Facebook. I just felt like this is something that I had to say. I'll put up on the screens really quick. There it is. Okay, I'll read it from here. I know people who say they love unconditionally, but only under certain conditions. I know very good, dedicated Christian, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, etc., who are not the greatest of friends. I know people who aren't anywhere in line with my beliefs or theological views, and yet they are more loving than the ones who preach love. I know people who could care less about my spiritual affiliation, and yet they would drop everything they were doing just to make sure that I'm okay. I know people who just have it all wrong, they say that they live right. And I know people where even when everything is going wrong, they still do their best to do what is right. And just to close, last week, we celebrated our three-year anniversary here at Heartway Church, and I was DJing in the lobby, having a little party over there. It was really fun. And at the end of the, of the, of the event, I started to play all types of music. So I play the Cupid Shuffle, because I like social line dances. I played the Cupid Shuffle. Sorry. All right. Uh, I played the Cupid Shuffle. And uh, I always find, like, social line dances really funny because nobody wants to do it, but everybody wants to do it, right? <laughs> like, they want to do it. I don't know how to do it, right? And, and it just takes that one brave person to kind of just start doing those steps, taking the steps that nobody else will do. And then you get that one follower that makes it feel safe and we're okay. <laughs> And then after that, you get like another person and another person, and all of a sudden, everybody's dancing and everybody's celebrating. We're all doing the dance, and it's a beautiful thing. I just find that so fascinating. And I feel so much of life is just like that. It takes an individual to set the example, to take those steps that nobody else is willing to take. And it takes a follower or followers to be able to continue that and to invite other people into that party so that we're all part of this movement and we can change the world. And I'm not just talking about the power of leadership. I'm talking about the humility of a follower because it's the followers that change a random act of bravery into an act of leadership. And that's who we are. We're followers, followers of the way, followers of Christ, followers of Jesus. Jesus sets the example, and the way that we inspire and encourage others is not by words, but it's the dance that we do. It's the life that we live, and we set that example in that way. And I share bits and pieces of my life with you guys this morning because, you know, like I was saying, as I was writing this sermon, I wanted to bring my best, and I wanted to create the greatest sermon that I could, but I realized that the greatest sermon that I can ever share is not with words. It's with my life. And when you think about your own life and you think about the end of that time, we hope that there's a eulogy or a speech that somebody says in remembrance of our life because that's how people remember you. They remember you by the life that you live. As they say, the the best thing or the greatest thing on a tombstone is not the birth date or the death date. It's the dash, the dash in the middle. It's the life that an individual lived. It's a journey that they went on. I love what the early church fathers say. They say, preach the gospel always and when necessary, use words. Because the gospel isn't about the words that you say. It's about the life that you live. And our beliefs aren't to make us more holy, holy than others. Our beliefs are to make us better people. And if your beliefs don't make you a better person, I think you, you're missing the point. It's not about spreading the gospel. It's about being the gospel. So my greatest hope and prayer is that we all can take in and understand that the greatest sermon that you can ever share is your life. Because your sermon, it is your life. And that's how you really inspire people. That's how you can change the world. By following that example that Jesus sets for us as individuals and inspiring everyone to join the party and to keep on dancing. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for 
this morning. Uh, and we pray that you would change not only our minds or our hearts, but our lives. That you would change us from the inside out, that we can be an inspiration to others. Um, and as much as we may know and we may study, we pray that what really changes is our character and how we treat our family and our friends and the people that are around us. Make us better people. Make us better individuals. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We love you guys. Let's go grab some coffee. I'll see you guys outside. Happy Sunday.